On today's episode of You Asked, we've got a viewer who says their streaming and cable signals look better than their 4K Blu-ray discs. What is literally wrong with that picture? When am I reviewing the 65-inch TCL QM8? Which is better on Apple or Amazon Music, lossless or Atmos? And can the power of AI be used to create a self-calibrating TV? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is episode 63 of You Asked, the show where I answer questions you asked in hopes that I can help you and others with similar tech questions. If you've got a question for me, please email it to youasked at digitaltrends.com and we'll see if your question gets picked to be answered on the show. Let us begin with an email from Ed O'Brien who writes, I'm having issues getting the most out of watching movies on my Sony A95L using a Panasonic DP-UB824K Blu-ray player. When I watch a movie on cable or streaming, it looks noticeably better than it does on 4K Blu-ray. I tried direct comparisons with titles like The Fugitive and The Flash, and the cable and streaming versions have much better visual quality. It seems like every 4K Blu-ray I put in just leaves me saying, meh, while I'm blown away by the picture quality on cable and streaming. Are there certain TV or player settings I should be using when watching a 4K Blu-ray? Any help would be much appreciated. Thanks for your question, Ed, and for your persistence. I think you sent this question in like four times at least. And while it's often true that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, I picked this question to try to answer this week because if memory serves, this is the first time I've ever heard anyone mention that the picture they get from their cable or streaming service looked better than the 4K Blu-ray. And I just imagine a lot of other folks are gonna be curious about this as well. So I have two theories as to why you may find the image quality on the cable or streaming version to look superior to your 4K Blu-ray. First, I wanna mention that no matter the circumstances, one thing that will always be true is that the 4K Blu-ray disc has a higher bit rate and bit depth than just about any streaming service, although Sony's Bravia Core, they renamed it. I forget the name of it right now. You know what I'm talking about. Sony's streaming service does offer something very close to 4K Blu-ray. Now, that higher bit rate and bit depth helps with more subtle visual quality aspects like reduced color banding and other compression artifacts. However, most folks pick up on contrast and color more easily than those other more subtle cues, which is why I have developed two theories on your situation. One, you may simply like the look of SDR more than the look of HDR. SDR has a lower dynamic range, which means that the image tends to be more uniformly bright. That's like the basic explanation. If you have the brightness setting on your A95L set fairly high, the entire SDR picture will be a bit brighter and most folks would describe it as more vivid too. Now, if you aren't subscribed to the top tier of your streaming services like Max or Amazon Prime to unlock HDR, you may be getting 4K, but not HDR. You could be watching an SDR and therefore it could be that you find the SDR picture to be more enjoyable. Now, it's possible that you're streaming stuff through your cable box using the streaming services through your cable box and you could be getting HDR, but if you're using your cable services on-demand movie choices, then it's almost certainly gonna be SDR, I think. Anyway, you wouldn't be the first to think that HDR just doesn't knock everyone's socks off. And depending on how well the HDR was mastered, it may not be all that impressive anyway. Folks often complain HDR looks too dark, usually because they're not watching it in a pitch black room and because they just prefer brighter pictures. So that's the scenario. You might prefer the look of SDR to HDR. But the other issue could be that you aren't actually getting HDR on your Sony A95L from your Blu-ray player. It could be that you are in fact watching in HDR on those streaming services or less likely the cable box, but that you haven't changed a setting in your Sony TV that unlocks HDR for the HDMI input that you have your Panasonic Blu-ray player plugged into. On a Sony TV, you must go into the settings menu, then click channels and inputs, then external inputs, then HDMI signal format. From there, identify which HDMI port your 4K Blu-ray player is plugged into and select one of the enhanced options. 
If you don't do this, you won't get HDR from your disc player. Now your TV should have told you that this was the case, but it only does that once. So if you clicked out of that notice, then your Blu-ray player is just on cruise control, delivering the SDR version of your 4K Blu-ray discs. Now there is also a possibility that there's a setting inside the Panasonic 4K player that needs to be adjusted. That's possible whether you have the enhanced format setting turned on in the Sony or not. So having heard all of that, write me back and let me know what you think. And for everyone else out there, what do you think the issue and solution might be? Let Ed and I know down in the comments. Brad Haggerty writes, when will you review the 65 inch TCL QM8? Fair question, Brad. I gotta admit, I'm prioritizing three TVs over the 65 inch QM8 right now for a few reasons. One is that I did the monstrous QM8 91G already, though I understand that review is not an indication on how well the standard QM8 will perform, which is why I will be doing that review soon. The other reasons are that Panasonic TVs arrived and we haven't seen those here in 10 or 11 years. So I feel some urgency is deserved there. And because not only did I get a Samsung QN90D, but I got a massive 98 inch version of it. It's taken up a ton of space right now and I need to get it out of here like ASAP. So next review that you see on this channel will be the Panasonic W95A, followed by the Samsung QN90D, then the Panasonic Z95A, and then the TCL QM8. There's also a dragon hanging out here and I need to get to that. I also have this Sansui OLED that I feel like's really important as well. <sighs> the pressures of prioritization. Jonathan Morales writes, what is your take on Ultra HD lossless audio versus Dolby Atmos for music services such as Amazon Music or Apple Music? I understand that lossless audio has a higher bit rate and that Dolby Atmos is lossy by nature digitally, but with more and more music being released mixed with Atmos in mind, do you think the difference is negligible? I've gone back and forth listening to the differences multiple times and I can't seem to make up my mind. Thanks, Jonathan, I love this question. Uh, but first off, a quick clarification just so that I can be on the right side of the law here. While it is true that Dolby Atmos music on Apple Music and Amazon Prime Music currently does mean that you'll be getting a technically lossy music stream, it is not true that Dolby Atmos is, by its nature, lossy or not lossless. Dolby Atmos can be delivered lossless through Dolby True HD. The Atmos spatial audio encoding doesn't have anything to do with signal compression. However, as you correctly pointed out on Apple Music or on Amazon, you can either listen in Dolby Atmos or in lossless or high res lossless. However, I think the quality of the signal itself, whether it's compressed or not, is the least significant aspect when it comes to how vastly different the two channel version, the stereo version, sounds compared to the Dolby Atmos surround sound version. The Dolby Atmos mix that you get for any given title can be outstanding, or it can also sound like hot garbage. It really depends on who did the mix and what choices they made when they did the mix. I actually did a video all about this a few months back. You can click the little pop-up here um, if it's showing up, or we'll have the link down in the description. Sometimes the Atmos version has buried vocals, or they put a bunch of reverb on the vocal that wasn't there for the original mix. They may mix horns to the back of the room, which can sound great or terrible depending on how they did it, or also depending on your system. Like, look, a lot of folks already debate whether the difference between a high quality MP3 versus a, a lossless codec can be heard by most people. That debate notwithstanding, what they do to this music when they make it in Atmos, it's the wild west. And sometimes it's awesome, while other times it's downright terrible. So if I were you, I'd be less concerned about lossless versus lossy and more concerned about two channel stereo versus Atmos surround mix. Because like, check out some of the Fleetwood Mac tracks. Those sound pretty great. But there are some Lauren Hill tracks that sound absolutely terrible 
after they put Atmos on them. Cole writes, Hey Caleb, with the rise in AI capabilities, do you think there will ever be an AI feature added to TVs that could perform a calibration? Maybe not to the level of a professional calibrator, but maybe a basic calibration? Ooh, that's a fun question. Uh, so first, let's start by acknowledging that Samsung has a smart calibration app that lets you use a Samsung Galaxy phone or an iPhone to perform a basic and a more advanced calibration. And while I've not conducted a test on how well Samsung's professional calibration holds up to a calibration performed by an actual professional, I hear that it does a pretty respectable job. I thought it did a pretty good job when I used it years ago. Now on the more advanced tip, some TVs do have Calman AutoCal built in. Now this is something a professional or maybe a more advanced home user might use, but it automates a bunch of the more manual work that's involved in calibration, namely making adjustments and then remeasuring, checking what you did and then adjusting again and then remeasuring. But I do think that AI does have the potential to make calibration more accessible to consumers. Thing is, for this to happen, TV manufacturers and software developers are gonna have to get on board. Here's how I think something like AI self-calibration might work. I don't think it is likely the software would get built into the TV. That seems like something we should offload, okay? So let's say we offload all the processing and AI work to the cloud. I mean, you could use a PC, I guess, but we're looking to the future and cloud computing just makes more sense for this. So something like Calman calibration software would need to run in the cloud and no matter what, the user is gonna need a meter like the colorimeter that we use. Something not too expensive maybe, but accurate enough to provide a quality calibration suitable for anyone but the most ardent professionals. We need to be able to have the TV gather the measurement data from the colorimeter or spectro, send that measurement data back to the cloud-based calibration software. That program would analyze the data, send picture settings adjustments to the TV, then it would retest and then on and on from there. Honestly, I think that could be done now and without AI. I think where advanced AI, whether it's ChatGPT or Bard or something made custom for this, I think where that would come in is by asking the user a series of questions about their needs and wants. See, I think one of the most important human elements involved in calibration is the calibrator knowing how the TV needs to be set up based on what the customer tells them their needs and wants are. There's discretion that needs to be used there and AI would be needed for that. Also, AI would be needed for an ongoing feedback loop. Like the AI could ask, here's how that's gonna look. Do you like this? What would you want to be different? And then the AI would need to interpret the response and implement it. I think it can be done like today. We just need to see cooperation by several entities to make it a reality. Will we actually see something like this happen? My guess is not for a couple of years at best. I'm not sure the need is actually great enough. It's hard enough as it is to get the overwhelming majority of new TV owners just to adjust the picture mode preset or turn off eco mode. It's hard to see a big return on investment for what I think would be a pretty sizable project. But I gotta say, it sounds really cool and it's fun to dream about that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for your question. Thanks as always for watching everyone. Hey, the holidays are coming. What is the one piece of tech you'd get for the holidays if you could? Let us know down in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you wanna support this show and this channel. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like.